Welcome to the 25th video on Ancient Greece and part 9 of the Peloponnesian War. And we are continuing on with the Sicilian expedition. Now in the last video, of course, Alcibiades convinced the Athenian assembly to invade Sicily. And so in 415 BC, a very large armada arrived off the coast of Sicily. And they set up a base at Catana. But, of course, Alcibiades was recalled, and he fled to Sparta. And we'll get to that in the last slide of this video. Now, after the departure of Alcibiades, Nicias and Lamachus were left in charge. But Nicias was the more senior general, so he was the de facto leader. And this was a problem for the campaign because Nicias was a very conservative general. He picked campaigns that he knew he could win riskier campaigns he tended to avoid. And so he really was the wrong man for the job. Alcibiades was really the general that should have been leading this because, after all, this was his plan. But as we know now, he was fired and then sentenced to death. Now, Nicias is in a catch-22. What he really wants to do is sail home. But he knows anything short of a victory will not be accepted by Athens. And if he arrived in Athens empty-handed, the Athenian assembly just might put him on trial and he might end up like Alcibiades. So he starts cruising around Sicily, pondering how to get out of this mess. And what he eventually decides to do is follow his original plan. And that is to collect some cash from Segesta and to settle the dispute between Segesta and Salinas. And so he does just that, but he only collects 30 talents from Segesta. And that was basically a drop in the bucket, because the entire operation would cost around 2,000 talents. So that really wasn't going to please Athens at all. Ironically, Nicias also decides to follow Alcibiades' original plan, and that is to convince some of the Sicilian cities to join Athens in an alliance. But this turned out to be an utter failure, and that was because most of the towns in Sicily believed that Athens had come to conquer all of Sicily, and from their perspective, they saw no point in assisting Athens. All they would be really doing here is replacing one conqueror with another. And at least Syracuse was a known quantity. They were located on the island. The Athenians were across the sea in some other foreign land. Now this failure to act promptly against Syracuse gave the Syracusans exactly what it needed most, time. And that time was a critical element. It gave the Syracusans time to organize the defenses of their city, as well as to plan for an attack. And so this is the main problem with Nicias. He was being way too cautious. He was not looking for ways to win the battle. He was trying not to lose the battle. And that's always a dangerous recipe for a disaster. I always like to ask myself, what would Alexander or Hannibal have done in a situation like this? Well, I think they would have followed followed Lamachus's original plan, and that was to launch an immediate assault against Syracuse and to use one of the greatest weapons of all, the element of surprise, to force a quick surrender. But of course, Nicias does not follow that strategy. And so that's really the difference between great generals and good generals. And I don't mean to criticize Nicias. He was a very good general. But as I said before, he always picked campaigns that he knew he could win. For instance, Kithra. You will remember we talked about Kithra. That pretty much was a very easy campaign that Nicias knew he could win. The Sicilian campaign, however, was very risky, and that required somebody that was a little bit more bolder than Nicias. So the Athenian contingent eventually ended up back in Katana. Now, in Katana, Nicias actually devised a pretty clever strategy, and this was one of his better maneuvers in this campaign. Now, Nicias wanted to draw the main Syracusan army away from the city, and to do that, he tricked the Syracusan army into attacking Katana. But while the Syracusan army was on the march towards Katana, the Athenians boarded their ships at night and headed towards Syracuse. And they sailed right into the Great Harbor and landed right here on this map. Now this afforded a nice defensive position for the Athenians. This dark green area right here is a marsh, and there were these two rivers here that acted as a natural defense barrier. And if there were any problems, of course, the Athenians could sail right back to Katana. And so this was a good position in which the Athenians could launch an attack on Syracuse. And so they set up an encampment here for the rest of the night. Now the Syracusans got wind of what was going on, and through a rapid march were able to set up camp right across the river from the Athenians. And so this set up the first battle of Syracuse. Now on the next day, the Athenians broke camp and marched across the Anapus River, which you see right here, and set up in battle formation across from the Syracusans. Now the Argives and Montanians took up the position on the right, and the Athenians occupied the center, and the rest of the allies were on the left. 
The Athenian army was about eight ranks deep. Now the Syracusans had double that number. They were 16 ranks deep and had twice the amount of depth that the Athenians did. They also possessed 1,200 cavalry. The Athenians, on the other hand, had no cavalry. And that seems a little strange to me that they would have forgotten to bring cavalry on this expedition. But here they were without any cavalry. Now the Annapus River, which was right here, would prevent the Syracusan cavalry from outflanking the Athenians, so that did provide some uh, level of protection. Now before the battle started in earnest, Thucydides will tell us that Nicias marched up and down the Athenian lines, speaking words of encouragement to his men. And so with that, the battle began. And the battle lasted for a long time. And there was actually a thunderstorm that broke out during the fighting. And so that added to the confusion that was going on. Now, after a long and difficult fight, the Argives finally drove back the left wing of the Syracusans. And then the Athenian hoplites, despite being outnumbered, began to push back the Syracusan center. And with that, the Syracusans began to flee the battlefield. The Syracusan cavalry, however, saved the day and prevented a complete rout of their army. And so the Syracusan army was able to retreat back to the city. And so the Athenians placed a victory trophy on the battlefield and collected their dead. Now winter was fast approaching, and so the Athenians sailed back to Katana. Now at Katana, Nicias requested more money from Athens, and mainly that money would be used to bribe some of the other Sicilian cities into joining up with Athens. Because if long speeches wouldn't work, perhaps money would. I mean, that's the oldest thing in the book, right? Use money to get somebody to do whatever it is you want them to do. Now Syracuse decided to make some needed reforms during the winter. One thing they did was reduce the number of generals from 15 to 3, and this would allow for a more unified command structure. They also requested help from Sparta. Now, at Sparta, Alcibiades was an absolute disaster for Athens. He tried to convince the Spartans to enter the war on behalf of Syracuse. He explained to the Spartans that once the Athenians were done in Sicily, they would launch an all-out assault on the Peloponnesus, and this eventually would lead to the Athenians dominating all of Greece. Then Alcibiades dropped the bomb. He explained to the Spartans that if they occupied Desilea in Attica, they could cut off the Athenians from their silver mines in Attica, and that would have a major impact on the Athenian economy. In the end, the Spartans chose to send a small fleet to assist Syracuse, and we will get to that in the next video.